So we've seen a number of oscillatory phenomena, and we have seen a bunch of models that reproduce and predict that oscillating behavior. And I want to talk a little bit about what happens when that oscillatory behavior onsets and what is its cause. Now, we've been talking about bifurcations. And we saw the saddle node bifurcation, the transcritical bifurcation, and the pitchfork bifurcation. And you remember the definition of a bifurcation is a change in the qualitative behavior of a differential equation as a parameter passes a critical point, as some parameter p becomes greater than some value p0. And we saw a whole series of examples of this in equilibrium point systems. That's what a pitchfork bifurcation is. That's what a saddle node bifurcation is. And this word qualitative behavior, you remember, got defined as a change in the equilibrium point structure or, and or stability. So that's the definition of bifurcation, a change in the equilibrium point structure or stability as a parameter passes a critical point. Now let's look at what happened, for example, with the HPG system. And you remember H prime and P prime and G prime. And you remember the term 1 over 1 plus g to the n, which is the feedback. And you remember that that feedback term, in particular, the steepness of the feedback as measured by that n, was a critical parameter in determining the behavior of the model. And that, in particular, if n was 3, for example, then all three variables quickly went to equilibrium with time. If we increase n, they still go to equilibrium. If we increase n, they still go to equilibrium. But there was a magic point around n equals 9 where at that parameter value, and for larger parameter values, the system went into stable limit cycle oscillations. So what is that? Well, that meets the definition of a bifurcation. Before the bifurcation, for low values of n, the system had an approach to a stable equilibrium point. But for n greater than 9, the system now has a limit cycle attractor. And that limit cycle attractor is approached for all values of h, p, and g is approached and is stayed on and any initial condition goes to it, which means that this equilibrium point here in the middle is now an unstable equilibrium point. The slightest perturbation off it, you go out to the limit cycle. So this is a change in the stability of that equilibrium point from stable to unstable, it is therefore 
a bifurcation, but it isn't any of the bifurcations that we've seen so far. It's not saddle node, it's not transcritical, it's not pitchfork. It's a new kind of bifurcation. It's the birth of a stable limit cycle as a parameter passes a critical point. The central equilibrium point goes from stable to unstable and a new stable limit cycle is born. This is a very, very important kind of bifurcation. Its popular name is Hopf bifurcation, and that's the name that you'll see it under. But its full correct name, to give correct credit, is a Poincaré Andronov Hopf bifurcation in historical order. These were the people who really discovered it, and the French don't like it when you leave Poincaré's name off it, and the Russians don't like it when you leave Andronov's name off it, but a lot of people do, and it's colloquially just called Hopf bifurcation, although that is historically inaccurate. This is the name you will see it under. But what is a Hopf bifurcation? It's a passage from a stable equilibrium to a stable oscillation. And you saw it in the HPG. You saw it in the muscle stretch reflex when the time delay got long, the muscle stretch reflex went into oscillation. You saw it in the insulin glucose case when there was a delay in the production of insulin by glucose, the system went into oscillation. Every one of those is a hop bifurcation. And it was also a hop bifurcation that brought down the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So hop bifurcation is an extremely important subject. It's the birth of an oscillation. So to wrap up this whole discussion, I want to make some remarks in a very big picture. We've talked about the idea of bifurcation. And we talked about the idea of bifurcation as representing the idea of a qualitative change from one equilibrium point to three, from a stable equilibrium point to an unstable equilibrium point with new stable equilibrium points, or in the case of hop bifurcation, from a stable equilibrium point to an unstable one surrounded by a limit cycle. But I want to focus on this concept of qualitative change because it's kind of unusual, it's kind of interesting because these are mathematical models, we're talking about mathematics, and people identify mathematics with quantitative. You will see phrases like, well, this is quantitative biology and we're doing quantitative modeling and this is a quantitative methods course and we're looking to increase your quantitative skills. But the truth is that's not a really good term. And to be completely honest, quantitative is not a really good term to describe the mathematics here. It's not really quantitative. And the whole term quantitative, I think, carries a bad connotation that math is like a kind of accounting. And you have to get all your quantities correct. And you have to get the exact values of x's and y's and you do quantitative calculations. This is really not quantitative. This is 
subject, the subject is often referred to by a name which is qualitative dynamics. And you can look it up under that name because it's really talking about qualitative changes in dynamical systems. And in particular, what the bifurcation theory gives you is a very powerful handle on the causes of qualitative change. So you remember in the public opinion model, we had this variable A, which was the strength of the bandwagon effect, the strength with which you want to be like your neighbors. And for low values of A, the vector field looked like this with one stable equilibrium point in the center, which was evenly balanced populations. And this was low A. And then for high A, the system changed and it looked like this. And now there are three equilibrium points and this one is unstable, positive slope, and these two are stable. And this was the emergence of a bipolar population, whereas this is a unimodal population with a single peak at zero. So if I were to ask you, what is the cause of the emergence of the polarized political opinion? you can give a definite answer. You can say because A increased, and the critical number here is one, if A is less than one or A is greater than one. If I ask you why did political opinion polarize, you can now answer that question and say because A became stronger, in particular became greater than one, and the single equilibrium point was no longer stable and you got public opinion. So this gives you a way of giving you a causal explanation for this qualitative phenomenon. So now we have a new bifurcation. It's Hopf bifurcation. And in Hopf bifurcation, as we just said, we go from a stable equilibrium point to an unstable equilibrium point and a new stable limit cycle attractor. Now, the parameters that change to move you from this situation to this situation, we saw that in the typical model, we could make a bifurcation diagram, just like we made for the saddle node and the pitchfork, where we put the parameter and then we put the behavior. And we could make a model undergo this oscillation, and in particular, we were looking at a time delay and a steepness of the negative feedback. Steep feedback, and we said that there's a curve, in fact, it's a hyperbola, that separates the oscillatory regime 
from the non-oscillatory regime. And this is the bifurcation line right here. And it says that if you cross that line, you begin oscillating. So the hop bifurcation, as we just said about other bifurcations, the hop bifurcation gives you the cause of the qualitative change. And if someone asks you now, why did this system go into oscillation? What are the causes of oscillation in this system? You can now answer that the bifurcation theory tells us that either we have increased the slope with some time delay, in other words, we've done this, or we have increased the time delay with some slope, which means we have done that. So these are the mechanisms for the presence or onset of oscillation in a system according to the Hopf bifurcation theorem, which now gives us a handle on the causes of oscillation. So this idea of qualitative behavior and changes in qualitative behavior is a very, very important concept and it's really kind of motivating the basic idea of this course. That how do we explain things? We look for qualitative changes. We look for the change, as you saw, maturation of an oocyte. It was immature, increasing amounts of progesterone, took it past the saddle node bifurcation, and it became a mature oocyte, ready for fertilization. That's a qualitative change. You saw the commitment from a preadipocyte to an adipocyte. That's a qualitative change. It is now a fat cell. And in general, the idea behind this math, which is so powerful, is this whole idea of explaining forms of motion. And I take that phrase, forms of motion, from a lecture I attended that totally changed my life that I want to share with you. Uh, when I was in graduate school. A super famous mathematician named René Thome won a Fields Medal, serioso mathematician, came through town. And Thome had been a pioneer in this concept of qualitative dynamics and had written an extremely important book about morphogenesis as a mathematical subject in which he kept talking about forms of motion and how what we really want to do is explain forms of motion. And I'm in this talk that he gave. My school invited him and he gave a talk and I was sitting there. And he's talking about forms of motion and forms of motion. And this old guy in the back uh, has an objection and he says, well, but sir, certainly the equations are what matter. Mathematics is about equations and the equations are what determine everything. The equations for the motion. And Tom looks at him and he says, Monsieur, Consider the fall of a leaf in his very French style. He says, consider the fall of a leaf. It has a certain slip-sliding form of motion 
until it loses energy. And when it loses energy, it goes into another form of motion, which is rotatory. Now, Monsieur will certainly recognize, do you want to know the equation for this? We have a huge problem because, as Monsieur recognizes, uh, these points here, the function has no derivative. These are corners. And because the function is not differentiable at these corners, this is not even a function. It's not an analytic function that can be built up out of elementary functions. So this is a huge problem. And Monsieur will also recognize that here is another motion. And I'm not exactly replicating the previous. And of course, the equation for this second curve that I drew is different from the equation for the first curve. So the equations are not really the insight into this. What we really need to understand is this form of motion and this form of motion and what parameter has changed to take us from this form of motion across a bifurcation into this form of motion. That, sir, is what we are trying to do. And I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. And that is indeed what we're trying to do. And that is kind of the purpose of all of this math is to give us an understanding of forms of motion and qualitative changes in the forms of motion.